Our next talk is from T, Lesbians United from the USA. T is the national organizer of Lesbians United, a grassroots lesbian only organization that works to educate the public about homophobia, transgenderism, and the abuses being carried out by Big Med and Big Pharma. This talk is an overview of Lesbian, Lesbians United's research into puberty suppression, which is covered in depth in the report, the recent publication. Thank you so much, and over to you, T. I want to make you all aware that Lesbians United recently released a free publication on puberty suppression titled Puberty Suppression Medicine or Malpractice. We studied over 300 sources and found evidence for over 100 side effects of puberty suppressing drugs, and we're trying to get this information out to the public. So the biggest takeaway here, I'm going to spoil you, is that there is a lot of research out there on these drugs. I keep hearing people say that the research on puberty suppression just isn't there. After this talk, you'll never say that again, and I would encourage you to send anyone who is still saying that to our website. So a quick primer, these drugs that are being sold now as puberty blockers are better known as GnRH agonists. These drugs have been in use on adults since the 1980s. They are an agonist or an artificial mimic of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which is one of the body's natural hormones. During adolescence and adulthood, natural GnRH is produced in the hypothalamus, a part of the brain, and picked up by special receptors on the pituitary gland. This isn't the greatest brain diagram, but you can see basically where this happens. GnRH agonists uh, bind to special receptors on the pituitary gland, um, just like the natural hormone does. In its natural form, GnRH signals the pituitary gland to produce something called luteinizing hormone, LH, and LH in turn signals the gonads to produce the sex hormones. The body naturally produces GnRH impulses. So this is how the pituitary gland is designed to process it. But GnRH agonists work continuously. In doing so, they overstimulate the GnRH receptors and the pituitary gland gets overloaded and stops processing GnRH in self-defense. No GnRH processing means no LH, which means no sex hormones. This is actually quite dangerous because the sex hormones have a lot of functions in the body. For example, there are sex hormone receptors on cardiomyocytes, which are cells that control the heartbeat. Estrogen and testosterone are also involved in bone maintenance, brain health, DNA repair, obviously in reproduction, and in a lot of other areas. So completely removing sex hormones from the body can have massive systemic effects, and these can cascade into multiple areas of the body, as we'll see later on. GnRH agonists aren't just used to prevent healthy children from growing up. They were first used for prostate cancer, and they've been used for a number of other conditions that are caused or exacerbated by sex, uh, excess sex hormones, at least in theory. So for example, there's a theory that endometriosis is caused by excess estrogen. Excess testosterone can cause uterine fibroids in women, and some children's bodies start producing sex hormones unusually early, which is considered a medical condition. GnRH agonists have also been used to chemically castrate sex offenders, since lowering testosterone lowers men's libido. And they were at one point used as a supposed cure for autism on one doctor's theory that high testosterone caused autism, for which, as far as I know, there's no actual evidence. You'll be happy to know that the doctor in question, Mark Dyer, actually lost his medical license for using GnRH agonists on autistic kids. And in their judgment revoking his license, the Maryland State Board of Physicians cited a known substantial risk of serious harm, including risk of bone and heart damage and fertility suppression. And the same document quotes Mark Geyer himself, admitting that the drugs caused chemical castration. A big part of this scandal was that Geyer knowingly chemically castrated autistic children with GnRH agonists, which are the same drugs doctors are now giving to children as puberty blockers. The current justification for giving these drugs to children is that these kids have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, which is a supposed mental illness listed in the DSM-5. The symptoms include clinically significant distress and things like wearing non-stereotypical clothes, not conforming to narrowly defined roles, and playing with Hot Wheels when you're expected to be playing with Barbies. So basically a lot of sexist stereotypes. We know from news reporting and scientific studies that the gender dysphoria diagnosis is disproportionately given to girls, autistic kids, and kids who will grow up gay or lesbian which makes sense at a glance, right? There are a lot of silly girl stereotypes out there that don't represent most girls. One of the hallmarks of autism is not fitting into social norms. And homosexuals are more likely to be non-stereotypical for our sex. 
Actually, you could say that all homosexuals go against those stereotypes because we're not developing crushes on people of the opposite sex. The stereotype of a girly girl is that she's boy crazy. And the stereotype of a teenage boy is that he's constantly thinking about having sex with girls. And if you're homosexual, you automatically don't fit that. So that's common sense, but there's also hard evidence to show that homosexuals are more likely to buck sex stereotypes from a young age and more likely to be given a gender dysphoria diagnosis early in life. So as we see here, a 2014 paper found that, quote, early onset female to males, that's girls who have been given a gender dysphoria diagnosis, predominantly reported sexual attraction toward females. In other words, this paper is evidence that most young girls diagnosed with gender dysphoria will grow up lesbian. Another study, this one's from 2008. This study looked at people who had been assessed for gender identity disorder, the precursor to gender dysphoria, as children, and asked them how they turned out, homosexual, bisexual, or heterosexual. Most of the people who stopped fitting the criteria for gender identity disorder were heterosexual, but most of the people who still fit the criteria as adults were same-sex attracted. So two takeaways from this study. One, while a significant number of the participants were heterosexual, homosexuals were really disproportionately represented. And two, this study tells against the idea that some people are truly trans. When people say that we need more rigorous assessments for gender dysphoria, and that some people really do need the drugs and surgeries, namely the people who felt this way consistently since childhood, what they're really saying is that it's okay to give harmful drugs and surgeries to the gay ones. Those are just a couple of the studies that demonstrate the overrepresentation of homosexuals in the population diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Here are a few more just to demonstrate that they exist. And uh, there will be little snippets of bibliography throughout this talk, by the way, again, just to show you that these sources do already exist. In addition to those sources, there's also a 2018 study that demonstrates that young teens who are bullied for being gay are more likely to believe that they are or should be the opposite sex. And there's a 2017 study that demonstrates pretty clearly that homosexuals are less likely than heterosexuals to adhere to sex stereotypes in early childhood. The study found that young girls who grew up lesbian were 12 to 19 at times as likely as heterosexual girls to be extremely non-conforming. And young gay boys are 20 to 26 times as likely as heterosexual boys to be extremely non-conforming, which means that homosexuals run a much higher risk of being diagnosed with gender dysphoria in childhood. And I'll finish the section with this one. It's from a study of puberty suppression and it's really stark. This study had 45 adolescents in the control group, so not diagnosed with gender dysphoria, versus 40 adolescents who were diagnosed with gender dysphoria. All 45 adolescents in the control group were heterosexual, and all 40 adolescents who had been diagnosed with gender dysphoria were same-sex attracted. So it should be clear by now that homosexuals are being disproportionately diagnosed with gender dysphoria, that although we are a tiny minority, we make up the majority of childhood gender dysphoria diagnoses. So let's talk about what the medical establishment is actually doing to younger generations of lesbians and gay boys by prescribing GnRH agonists to them. These are some of the side effects of GnRH agonists reported in scientific studies. We couldn't fit them all in one slide, but you can see that there are a lot of them and that many different areas of the body can be affected by these drugs. And these aren't minor side effects. Some of them are potentially life-threatening like suicidality, stroke, and pituitary apoplexy. Some are serious chronic illnesses like diabetes and fibromyalgia. The thyroid can be affected, which can cause systemic issues. Many of these effects are not easily reversible. This is how hormones work. They're involved in a lot of different bodily processes and an overload or deficiency of any one hormone can cause a cascade of effects throughout the body. So again, all of these side effects are substantiated by scientific evidence. A lot of these effects have been observed in studies of adults taking GnRH agonists for various conditions. These side effects specifically have been reported in children or adolescents. There are fewer studies of children and adolescents, and they're generally of poorer quality than the studies of adults, but they do still provide a lot of evidence for negative side effects. You can see there are still quite a lot of them, and there are still some very serious conditions on this list. I'll go through a few that are of particular concern for adolescents. One of the most well-attested side effects of GnRH agonists is loss of bone mineral density, which is a measure of how concentrated the minerals are in a person's bones. BMD is at its highest point, so your bones are the strongest they'll ever be, at the end of adolescence. This is called peak BMD. GnRH agonists are known to lower peak BMD. 
So that can lead to a lifetime of weak bones and it increases a person's risk for osteoporosis and fractures and other bone and tooth conditions. This is from the best available longitudinal study of adolescents treated with GnRH agonists. Quote, BMD was below pretreatment potential and either attainment of peak bone mass has been delayed or peak bone mass itself is attenuated. So this study essentially found that adolescents who took GnRH agonists didn't live up to their potential peak BMD. Their bone health is going to be a concern for the rest of their lives. Again, I want to impress on you just how many sources already exist for the negative effects of GnRH agonists. So here are seven additional studies that show that GnRH agonists negatively impact the bone health of adolescents. And here are just some of the studies of adults that show that GnRH agonists negatively impact adults' BMD and increase osteoporosis risk and fracture risk. Another area of the body GnRH agonists are known to affect is the thyroid gland. The thyroid is responsible for maintaining many bodily functions, including metabolism, bone maintenance, and the development of the bones and brain. So obviously it's a very important body part. Thyroid conditions can cause serious and chronic illness. A 2019 study of 50 children who were given GnRH agonists for precocious puberty found that 70% of those children had impaired thyroid function. There have also been a couple of studies that found thyroid dysfunction and changes in thyroid-related hormone levels in adults or adolescents. And there are a number of case studies that report thyroid conditions, including hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, thyroiditis, and thyroid autoimmunity. So when used on adolescents, GnRH agonists are intended to prevent development. This includes reproductive development. And it's pretty obvious that GnRH agonists successfully do that. This quote is from a review of GnRH agonists specifically for adolescents uh, diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Quote, suppression of puberty can pause the maturation of germ cells, meaning eggs or sperm, and thus affect fertility potential. And here's another from a similar review. Quote, GnRH A prevents maturation of germ cells, which could be used for biological fertility potential. And there's nothing in either of these reviews that says, oh, don't worry, eggs and sperm will go back to maturing normally after you discontinue the drug there's not really any evidence to suggest that this effect is reversible. Aside from one study of girls with precocious puberty who discontinued treatment by age 11, and that study doesn't necessarily prove that those girls ended up being able to reproduce. It just shows that their anti-malarian hormone levels went back to normal, meaning they weren't actively experiencing ovarian dysfunction. It doesn't necessarily mean that their eggs are viable. There are also studies of adult men that suggest that GnRH agonist induced infertility may not be reversible. This is a study from 1989 saying, quote, gonadal impairment may not be as reversible as generally suggested. And another, spermatogenic suppression after prolonged GnRH agonist administration may not be as reversible as previously suggested. Note the date on this quote. This information has been available since at least 1985. I should also note that there is at least one study of girls who took a GnRH agonist for precocious puberty that found a significantly increased rate of PCOS and hyperandrogenemia, which is extra excess testosterone in women. And both of those conditions can cause infertility as well. In addition, GnRH agonists cause low libido and prevent sexual development. And this is a really well-known effect of the drug. In fact, a lot of studies of adult men use the term GnRH agonists interchangeably with chemical castration. This is obviously a concern for every adolescent who's put on GnRH agonists, the fact that they won't be able to develop sexually well on the drug and that they might be permanently sexually stunted. As far as I'm aware, there's no usable scientific data on whether adolescents who missed the normal window for puberty because of GnRH agonists are able to develop sexually later on. It seems unlikely, and some researchers have expressed worries about it. This is from Corte et al. 2008, which reviewed some of the issues around GnRH agonists for adolescents. Quote, early hormone therapy may interfere with the patient's development as a homosexual. This may not be in the interest of patients who, as a result of hormone therapy, can no longer have the decisive experiences that enable them to establish a homosexual identity. Basically, GnRH agonists might prevent some adolescents from realizing that they're homosexual because they're not able to have any sexual urges at all. And keep in mind that scientific evidence shows that most of the kids being diagnosed with gender dysphoria at a young age, so most of those who will be primed to take GnRH agonists right at the start of adolescence are homosexual. And then GnRH agonists have been shown to lower IQ and impact other measures of intelligence. 
So these are two studies of children treated with GnRH agonists for precocious puberty. In the first from 2001, quote, intelligence quotient levels decreased significantly during treatment. In this study, the average IQ actually fell from 100.2 to 93.1. In the second from 2016, girls in the control group had an average IQ of 102, and girls treated with GnRH agonists had an average IQ of 94. So in both of these studies, children treated with GnRH agonists are ending up seven or eight IQ points lower than they should be. So those are just a few of the side effects of GnRH agonists. There are many, many more, and let's just add back in the side effects that are documented in adult populations. To summarize, GnRH agonists lower BMD, which can wreak, wreak havoc on the skeleton, causing osteoporosis, osteopenia, and fractures. They increase risk factors for cardiovascular disease and diabetes, including blood pressure, weight, percentage body fat, arterial stiffness, arterial plaque, and insulin resistance. They cause thyroid dysfunction, which can damage the thyroid long-term. They can cause autoimmune diseases. They impact the digestive system. They can cause intracranial hypertension or high blood pressure in the brain, which in turn can cause blindness. They can cause pituitary tumors and sometimes cause those tumors to bleed or apoplexy, which is potentially fatal. They cause chemical castration. They actually cause sexual development to regress, including causing breasts and penises to shrink. They cause infertility, which may not be reversible even in adult populations. They have been shown to lower IQ in children, and they can impair cognitive function like working memory, attention, executive function, and visual spatial ability, and cause memory loss. They may cause chronic pain conditions like fibromyalgia and other muscle-related conditions, including rhabdomyolysis, which is potentially deadly. I'm about to touch specifically on the mental health side effects, but I want to leave this slide up for a moment and read to you what WPATH, the World Professional Organization for Transgender Health, says about GnRH agonists. WPATH calls puberty suppression fully reversible several times in its standards of care. That document goes on to say, quote, adolescents may be eligible for puberty suppressing hormones as soon as pubertal changes have begun. In order for adolescents and their parents to make an informed decision about pubertal delay, it is recommended that adolescents experience the onset of puberty to at least 10 or stage two. Some children may arrive at this stage at very young ages, e.g. nine years of age. WPATH continues, quote, Two goals justify intervention with puberty suppressing hormones. One, their use gives adolescents more time to explore their gender nonconformity and other developmental issues. And two, their use may facilitate transition by preventing the development of sex characteristics that are difficult or impossible to reverse if adolescents continue on to pursue sex reassignment. So a major reason for giving these drugs to adolescents is cosmetic. And then WPATH concludes that section by saying, quote, Neither puberty suppression nor allowing puberty to occur is a neutral act. Functioning in later life can be compromised by the development of irreversible secondary sex characteristics during puberty. So WPATH is comparing the healthy development of the body to all of this and acting as though both healthy development and this whole well-substantiated list of side effects both have pros and cons worth considering. And the pros they cite for puberty suppression are largely cosmetic. I also want to make it very clear that WPATH's assertion that puberty suppression with GnRH agonists is reversible is an outright lie. How many of the effects on this list seem easily reversible? Almost none, right? WPATH is a large and well-funded organization with many trained doctors and scientists at its disposal. If a few lesbians with no budget could find all this information, so can they. So there's absolutely no excuse for any of the untruths in that passage I read out from WPATH. I want to take a minute now to talk in particular about the mental health side effects of GnRH agonists. So again, these are the drugs sold as puberty blockers. And the media narrative surrounding these drugs is that they improve adolescents' mental health and make them less likely to commit suicide. If any of the side effects are ever discussed in mainstream media, it's couched as the side effects are worth it because the drugs prevent suicide. And this isn't true. In fact, it's the opposite. Scientific evidence shows that GnRH agonists actually increase the risk of suicide. Maybe the most compelling evidence actually comes from the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust, which if you're not familiar is a mental health trust in the UK whose so-called gender identity development service for kids has recently been under review. The Tavistock is in the business of prescribing GnRH agonists to adolescents, allegedly to improve their mental health. 
But in 2015, the Tavistock published data that shows an increase in suicidality among adolescents taking GNRH agonists. So here are the Tavistock's data. They asked adolescents two questions about suicidality. Once before starting GNRH agonists, that's the T0 column, and after a year on GNRH agonists, the T1 column. As you can see, the percentage of adolescents who reported not deliberately self-harming or attempting suicide decreased during that year, as did the percentage of adolescents who reported not experiencing suicidal thoughts. Meanwhile, the percentage of adolescents who made at least some self-harm or suicide attempt went up by about 3%, and the percentage of adolescents who experienced suicidal thoughts went up by about 7% during a year on GNRH agonists. The Tavistock's own report admitted that the increase in self-harm and suicide attempts was statistically significant. So in addition to data from the Tavistock, we also know that GNRH agonists cause or worsen other mental health conditions, which are themselves risk factors for suicide. These include depression, anxiety, and insomnia. And there have also been several case studies of adults who developed mania or psychosis after taking GNRH agonists. And all of these conditions have been linked to an increased risk of suicide. Here's a partial bibliography for these claims. Again, just to show you that sources do exist. My point here is it's not hard to pull together 20 sources that substantiate the link between GNRH agonists, mental illness, and suicide risk. So to recap, the big picture here is that a number of young children, most of whom will grow up to be homosexual, are being labeled as gender dysphoric and primed to take GNRH agonists when they start puberty. GNRH agonists cause systemic problems that may give them disabilities for life, certainly prevent them from maturing sexually, and likely prevent them from reproducing. They have cognitive impacts like lowering IQ, and they negatively impact mental health and increase the risk of suicide. So what we have to conclude here is that the popularization of puberty suppression is a recipe for an increase in health problems among gay and lesbians, and an increase in gay and lesbian suicides. And this extreme medical abuse is being propped up by the false narrative of gender dysphoria, and the myth of the suicidal transgender child. The fact that the diagnostic criteria for childhood gender dysphoria are rife with sexist stereotypes, and that bucking these stereotypes is an early sign of homosexuality, is what's making the looming gay and lesbian health crisis possible. At the same time, the gender dysphoria and transgender narratives render this crisis invisible, because the gay men and boys who are affected will be counted as heterosexual women and girls, and the lesbians who are affected will be counted as heterosexual men and boys. So lesbians and gay men who are trying to push back on this issue find ourselves in the impossible position of trying to point out a homosexual health crisis while not being permitted to identify any homosexual victims as such. So on that bleak note, I'd like to end with a call to action. As I've mentioned, Lesbians United recently released a free publication titled Puberty Suppression, Medicine or Malpractice that cites over 300 sources and adds up to an extremely sound argument against the practice of puberty suppression. To my knowledge, this is the most comprehensive document on the subject in existence. Lesbians United is a small organization without funding, without a PR team, without friends in the media. We've sent this document to several hundred journalists and organizations who could help us blow the whistle, and it's been seen already by thousands of people on social media. But what we really need is to get someone in the mainstream news to notice this document. And not necessarily to notice us, but just to report on the science. So I'm going to challenge each of you who's listening, and anyone who's watching on YouTube after the fact, to send this document to as many journalists, organizations, government officials, and political candidates as you can. You can email it, at them on social media, or even print it out and snail mail it. If you have a website, you can link to the document. If you sticker or leaflet, you can include a QR code. If you want to translate our research into another language or independently verify it and publish the results, please do. This is an unprecedented study and the information needs to be out there. It could save thousands of children.